what we are talking about here from Motorola is our story about hybrid cloud and container architecture with the zero touch automation. Um, how did we make it? How did we come here? Why did we implement? How did we implement is what are we going to share with you guys. Um, first, before even getting started with the business case and explaining the, some, um, some slides, this information with you guys, I want to share with you guys on how did we even get to this? Like, why did we want to implement this? Why did we want to implement a cloud architecture? Why did we want to implement an automation? Or now, why are we looking into the hybrid cloud? Why containers? So I think cloud, DevOps, automation, buzzwords. Everybody want to use it, everybody. So how many of you use that? Cloud, DevOps, automation, any one of them? Right, yep. So, but actually we were not, we were not really there. About a few years back, we did not even know what that is. Um, one fine day, I think it was a Thanksgiving, and uh, day after Thanksgiving, Monday, we had our motor.com, uh, where people are trying to place their orders for the phone. There was huge discounts. Monday morning, I think at 8 a.m., the discount started, the website crashed. And nobody was able to place any orders, nothing. Everything crashed. So then we started looking into it. Of course, we had a Cyber Awareness Day. The sale went on, and all the cell phones were sold. So that was good. But then, then that's the time from the IT when we started to look back and check, why did this happen? Why did it fail? What was the mistake that we have done? How should we re-architect um, our platforms, everything? That's when we started to look into the cloud, lightweight platforms. So till then, we were doing all our APIs, all our web services in some heavyweight ESBs sitting in our data center, which does not have any capability from the technical. Um, it can do the work, but that's it. Other than that, really not much of the capabilities. Then we started looking into it, doing some research, and then finally we started to look into WSO2. Now, the, the major reason why we have implemented WSO2 is because we know it's a lightweight ESB. We can spin any number of instances that we want. Um, we can even set up uh, the capabilities of auto-healing, auto-scaling. And then at that point of time, we started looking to Amazon AWS. So this is an ESB that's supposed to be hosted on Amazon AWS. We got started. So we got started. Um, we re-architected our entire ESBs, uh, went into a Micro-platform architecture, we set up multiple ESBs, we set up scripts where we can uh, spin up instances, spin down instances as we needed, everything like that. So in about a year, we accomplished what we want. Um, we were there, so next, next year again the Thanksgiving came, this time it was perfect. No issues, everything went absolutely fine. Um, but Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving, it comes to December, um, then we started looking at the cost. My manager started looking at the cost. He called me to the room one day, and he said, like, I don't think so, Amazon, AWS, yeah, of course, it's definitely much more cost efficient than what we have, but I still think there is a chance to make it better. I said, okay, one more challenge now. Then we started looking into what can we do. Then company went through a few mergers. Um, so now, how can we bring this back into our own data center, but not what we had before? How can we have the same capabilities, what Amazon, AWS is offering us, Plus, how can we save the cost? Then we started looking to OpenStack um, as an environment that we can set up on our, on our data center with the similar capabilities what Amazon AWS offers. So after that, um, we started, the team started looking into it and then starting to set up, started to set up the, um, the OpenStack environment on our data center, but this time, with the containers. So that's where our business case started, and that's where we started to get into how do we use containers, and how do we use the DevOps, how do we get into the DevOps model, and then finally, how do we go into the hybrid cloud approach. So that kicked, that kicked off our business case, which is right here. As I mentioned, the OpenStack private cloud deployment, um, which can replace, or first we thought we'll just immediately replace Amazon AWS, but later on, as the discussions went on, as multiple uh, discussions happened, we were like, okay, let it, both of the environments be up and running, but then we scale up and down the environments as needed. Um, if we want instances on Amazon AWS, if we want instances on our private cloud, then we just use it however we want. Um, 
the team has put in all the requirements. Of course, as I mentioned, we just do not want to go this time and build in uh, the OpenStack environment, but of course, implement the DevOps platform along with it. And then why containers? Um, I'm sure most of you heard about the Docker containers. Um, why did we choose? We, when we implemented WSO2 on Amazon AWS, we did not use any container technology. We just put it on VMs. But when we are starting to do on OpenStack, we decided to use containers. Why containers? Um, even on Amazon AWS, as I mentioned before, there was reason why we are paying cost to Amazon instances. I think the applications are, have been using the VMs, which doesn't need that, that computing, that compute power. So there is a way to optimize the cost, and not only cost, the flexibility. When we are talking about the auto scaling or the auto healing, those kind of features, you really need a lightweight um, containers as well that can actually help you to go to achieve that model. So that's why we have decided to use the Dockers, which is, it's a lightweight, we all know. It can scale up and down easily, and then um, it, it gives us the flexibility of the auto scaling. And this also give us the improvements in the DevOps in the platform layer, um, the capability as well. Now, DevOps again. So after we did this, while we are doing this, DevOps. I think everybody, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, DevOps is again uh, something everyone, everyone to achieve. But it's not the team. It's not the team that needs to be in a DevOps model. I think we need to have the platform in a DevOps model. So we were looking, we were trying to look to see how we can have actually the platform into the DevOps model rather than just combining all the teams, the build teams and the run teams say this is a DevOps team. Um, that started actually our thinking on how can we make, how can we make the platform to do end-to-end -end automation. That means if a developer develops the code and checks in into a repository, from there, without any touch, without any manual intervention, all the way till the code deployment, it should all be automated. So that we call it as zero-touch automation. So all the developer or the entire team that is only doing is developing it and checking into the repository, sitting back and watching it. They get the tickets. If there is any issue, there is a CR ticket raised in case of any deployments needed, or they get to view the reports, the test reports that are run with the open source test tools. So we have implemented that, and um, that is a homegrown application that we have implemented with so many open source tools, which I'll go in the next slides. But again, what does is, what is zero touch automation means to us, as I mentioned? No manual code updates. We have a code repository. The change ticket system, uh, we use ServiceNow, which is integrated into this. That would actually uh, make an API calls to ServiceNow and raise the tickets for the deployments. It would have an APIs to the Jira and um, implement uh, the change process in Jira. If there is any issues or anything like that, then it would raise a ticket and send the information to the developer so that they can look into it. And then it would kick off multiple test tools so that the unit testing, regression testing, and the performance testing can all be automated. Now, this entire pipeline is, is a flow that as soon as the developer checks in all the way to the production, this is a flow that we have designed. The name of the tool uh, that is a homegrown application, we call it as Debug360. And um, the, the major features of this Debug360 are it's a plug and play architecture that we have with the Dockers. Um, the complete, any new development in an integration model, anything, either you're just changing some of the scripts that we have, you're developing a new integration, anything is less than a week for us. So a real, real DevOps model, okay? You can pretty much, um, we have a single dashboard, we, uh, it's an IG, where you can go there and log into the dashboard and you can see the complete flow of an integration once developed and checks in. You can actually see a complete flow on how it progressed from one step to next step to the final step. And then um, the core testing, which I mentioned, it includes the unit testing, it includes regression testing, it includes the performance testing, which all combinedly can be executed in less than 10 minutes, okay? Um, there's also the capabilities during the performance testing. If it needs to spin up an instance, it has the capabilities uh, to call the heat scripts and do an auto scaling of the instances. Um, this, is, this is the one which helps us in achieving the CI CD process. And then we also have the traceability matrix of which developer developed the code, and once it checks in, uh, we can, as I mentioned, we can see everything in the dashboard on how that code 
from the time of the development till it go to the production, how, how did it flow through this process? There are two tools uh, that we used as part of our automated testing tools, TestNG. It's an open source tool uh, that we used for our regression testing and unit testing. Um, it's capable of carrying out, as I mentioned, even the integration testing. What we use for this framework is we use most of our APIs are JSON. Um, so we use it for the JSON validations. Um, we do it at the field level and the database values validation because there is logic in our APIs that we execute, especially our e-commerce integrations. And then if it is all the EI integrations, it actually compares the value from source to the target and makes sure that the right values are processed to the target database. And then even if it is an XML, then it does the XML validation. And then um, if the file is encrypted, then it even decrypts it and compares the value. So this is an open source tool in our debug 360 that gets kicked off uh, when an integration is developed to do the unit testing and the regression testing results. The next one that we use is JMeter. So JMeter is what we use, uh, which is again included in our um, debug 360 for our load testing. Why we use JMeter? This can be integrated easily with our continuous integrations. And then it is used to perform the end-to-end -end testing. And um, we use this a lot for our APIs to do the stress testing. Um, this gets kicked off after the unit and the regression testing is completed. Then next, this one, the, the JMeter scripts, get, uh, scripts gets kicked off. And then the end-to-end -end performance testing is done based on the configuration of number of users that we need, number of transactions, transactions per second that we need. We can actually configure, and then it, the, the test scripts gets executed. So once the test ng and the JMeter scripts are executed, it logs into Jira that it has been successfully completed, or if there's any issue in any of this tool, then it still logs a Jira ticket and send it to the developer showing the report of what went wrong. And then if it is successfully created, then we just have that, that goes automatically deploys into the next after we have an approval given in the tool. And then once all the UAT is done, that's of course when the users come in and they kick off and they do their testing. Then a service now ticket is automatically opened and then we go and approve it. The tool kinds of uh, validates the service now ticket and as soon as it sees that it's approved, it deploys the code into production. So that's how the entire zero touch automation DevOps is what we have done. So, so far, as I mentioned, uh, we have this instance, uh, we have the complete WSO2 in cloud without the Docker, Docker containers. We have the WSO2 on OpenStack uh, with the Docker containers and the DevOps 360. Now it's a chance for us, the next step for us on how can we integrate the instance sitting on Amazon cloud and the instance sitting on OpenStack and achieve our final goal of spinning the instances up and down as needed in both the environments. And my colleague Richard will take from here and he'll explain the cloud elasticity. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Shreem mentioned, my name is Richard Strito. I'm part of the uh, integration team at Motorola. Um, when we were challenged with this task, um, we had to uh, do some challenges against ourselves. Why do we want to do this? What are we trying to accomplish? A lot of it came down to cost, but also capabilities and enrich our developers to be able to do uh, development, not only on the, the cloud, but uh, internally as well. Uh, we have about 35 applications that we're evaluating for this type of architecture. We took the WSO2 challenge. We had been working with them for the last couple years, uh, implementing AWS uh, WSO2 managed service environment. Uh, we learned a lot from that. Uh, like Shreem mentioned, we introduced a lot of things into our DevOps uh, model and stuff like that. But as far as the cloud elasticity, we wanted to make sure we had the same DevOps procedures, same cloud capabilities, same application code, um, auto scaling, not only from the infrastructure, but also from the application as well, um, for the reason we chose uh, Dockers in that case. Um, and then we wanted to have the same test cases. As, as you guys know, you know, you're working on these sprints and your agile process. You're, you're, you're turning the wheel each time you're adding new features day in and day out. And to rewrite those test cases and have that not available to you for like, a, like in our case, in our e-commerce platform for order import, 
Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios taken in from different regions of orders and different things. There's different logic that we have to apply to that, not only just the validations, but the unit test cases. So we wanted to make sure that we were in sync, not only in AWS, but also in the OpenStack environment. As far as our environment, how it's set up today, this is just a 100-foot view. Um, you can see over here on the left-hand side, you know, we have our uh, private cloud environment, OpenStack in our data center in Chicago, and then we have Amazon in the U.S. for our public cloud. Um, we had built out the public cloud environment, like I mentioned, two years ago. In doing so, we're using things like the ELB, you know, OpsWorks. Um, at the time, we were only using the Amazon instances. In this case, to get cloud elasticity and, and follow in suit with the Docker's architecture, what we decided to do is use the EC2 container services. Um, and the way that we leveraged that was in our DevOps environment and our Docker registry in the OpenStack environment that you can see down in the pyramid. What we did was we push Docker's to that registry locally for our DevOps server, but before it gets pushed out to Amazon, or to OpenStack, essentially what it does, the artifacts are the only thing that really changes, but the code base and everything is still the same. So like in this case, you'll see in the AWS, we use RDS, but on the private cloud, uh, we're using uh, MariaDB as our uh, backend database of choice right now for our like retry uh, logic and those type of things. Um, we also use as a, our managing architecture, we did look at Swarm for Dockers. Uh, we ended up going with Kubernetes. Uh, based upon direction from WSO2 and our conversations with them. Um, it's actually been a really good uh, management for us as far as, you know, Shree mentioned into our DevOps model, we're using the, the Cube API server uh, APIs to manage this environment. Not only are we using Nagios APIs and those different things to kind of build that framework around this environment and have some control. Um, as far as our gateway right now, we're using the uh, CA Technologies uh, Layer 7 gateway. Um, before that, we had been using form systems and we're evaluating WSO2's API uh, manager as well. Uh, but the way it works right now, um, as I mentioned, we got about 35 apps that are uh, slated for this environment. So what we do right now in our e-commerce world, as we're kind of slowly rolling this out, is that 90% of the traffic we want to go to OpenStack to defer the cost internally. Um, and then 10% of those uh, transactions using the gateway we're actually routing to AWS into the EC2 container service as a kind of our initial step of kind of routing the traffic based upon the cloud that we want to uh, do at that time. Like Shree mentioned, um, one of the biggest challenges that we've had is during like launches, Cyber Monday, um, different product launches and stuff like that in previous architectures. This will kind of give us a way to, Layer 7 gives us that ability to kind of like, as we need the performance, we might do it on the private cloud, but have some level of the APIs uh, pointed to the AWS environment at that time, depending on what we got going on. Um, and then we do have, like, like I mentioned, we have a lot of apps that are already in AWS, so those API backends are all uh, in the layer seven gate, we are pointing to AWS. They don't, go, they don't get routed to OpenStack at this time until they've been Dockerized and they've gone through the DB, debug 360 and our whole DevOps process before we move them into this uh, OpenStack environment. The next couple of slides are a little bit, uh, you might need to get a little closer, but we'll take a stab here. Um, this is our architecture. Um, you'll see here on the left-hand side, uh, the layer seven gateway and across the top, that's basically the community's masters port mapping. So layer seven, the backend APIs get mapped to these ports on the K8 master. The K8 master is the one that talks to the Docker. We don't actually, the API is not pointed to the Docker itself that sit on the K8 nodes, which are in those little boxes there. They get routed to the K8 master. The K8 master has this ECT, ECTD uh, repository that manages the port mappings for us so that it knows when it comes over 30,004, that API needs to be routed to the, uh, uh, to the K8 node of this cluster and it, then it, it will you know, trigger the response back to the, to the application or the end user in some cases. So that's kind of the high level architecture. When we first started doing this, um, we basically Dockerized the ESB in the next slide, um, what I'll show you is that we actually um, are still running the DSS, the DAS server, the registry as a separate standalone instance in OpenStack. 
the goal is, you know, based upon the announcements today, and then just some of the, we wanted to take a step into this direction. We started with the ESB. We're gonna plan on looking at dockerizing the DSS, the registry, the message broker, and putting it into this architecture at some point in the near future, or maybe taking that step towards Bell Arena, as we all learned today. Uh, so we're gonna discuss that after this conference. Um, and like I mentioned, we're using uh, MariaDBs on the back end for our uh, databases internally. So each environment, we basically run in this environment, dev, SIT, perf test, and then we have a dog fooding environment uh, for pre-launch uh, testing uh, in our production environments. So um, what happens in this environment is uh, performance tests and production run in both AWS and OpenStack, but all our other non-production environments only run in OpenStack. And that's how we kind of distinguish the costs in AWS at this point. So our AWS, our AWS environment, um, you'll see here, uh, what we're doing here is uh, similar to what I just mentioned. On the far right, uh, we have the DSS, the app server, the metrics broker, the, um, and we have a puppet server environment that's kind of standalone. We've implemented the EC2 uh, container services. We're still using RDS, we're using the ELBs to kind of do the routing for the APIs from layer seven in those cases. So our goal then is when we push code out, to, like Shree mentioned, our, our uh, deployment strategy for DevOps, we'll push the uh, performance tests, but we'll also push the artifacts to AWS at the same time. So it's not like a separate process, it gets pushed out, everything's realized there, and we do the same thing for production as well. Um, our goal next is to, like I mentioned, we're gonna start working on the DSSs, the registries, and kind of fold it into that, really just dockerizing the whole architecture going forward. Mm -hmm.